Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. I first got to know Anthony Grayling when we were both writing bi-weekly columns for New Scientist magazine on alternate weeks. When we first met, we conspired to write each other's pieces one week to see if anyone would notice. But alas, New Scientist did away with that column format just before we could. The moment I met Anthony, I was immediately taken not only by his charming manner, but by his vast scholarship and his knowledge of history, and more importantly, by how he used his field of philosophy to help better understand the world. He was a professor of philosophy at Birkbeck College at the University of London before becoming headmaster of the New College of Humanities, where I also teach as a visiting professor. His view of philosophy as an amalgam of critical thinking and questioning meshes with my own, and his lack of jargon makes him one of the most accessible philosophers writing today. Most recently, he's written two books motivated by events over the past five years around the world, and I took advantage of this opportunity to discuss current issues from Brexit in the UK, where he's been quite vocal, to Trump in the US, and to get his take on the historical perspective associated with the challenges of democracy, free speech, and the relevance of philosophy. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program and all our programs immediately upon their release at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Anthony, it's a delight to be with you in your lovely college here in London and, and have a chance to chat about so many things. And, uh, as always, uh, be illuminated by you. I wanted to actually ask you a question I've never asked you, I don't think, which is, what got you interested in philosophy? Oh, this started really early. Mm -hmm. You know, I was brought up in, in Africa, in Central Africa. My dad and my parents were British, but they, my father was working abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in those days, we had no television. It was very difficult to get uh, BBC on <laughs> on the radio even. Uh, you couldn't go for walks in the country. You get eaten by lions. So, oh. you know, we was kind of stuck reading. And, and <laughs> we had a set of encyclopedia at home. When I was a kid, I used to lie on my stomach on the floor, paging through it, looking at these pictures of these great iconic figures like Socrates and Plato. And so on. And I really wanted to know what that was all about. I tried to make sense of the articles in the encyclopedia, but, you know, I was eight or nine or something. Yeah, yeah. But when I got a ticket for the grown up part of the library when I was about 12, what did I find? I found the, the complete works of Plato in the Benjamin Joe translation. Ah. And I was so excited. And I took down one volume and I opened it at the beginning of a dialogue called The Comedies, which is a very early yeah, dialogue of yeah. Plato's. Mm -hmm. And it's very accessible. It's a very easy read. And I read it and I thought, this is fantastic. If this is what these great guys devoted their lives to, I'm going to do the same. And I discovered a really interesting thing, and that is that if you're interested in philosophy, seriously interested, yeah. it's a kind of license to stick your nose into everything. Find yeah. out about history, about science, about society, about politics. And it's been true. You know, ever since then, I've just... Uh, stuck my nose into all this. It's things. an intellectual menagerie. You can go, go in, in fact, that's one of the characteristics, one of the reasons I think I enjoy you so much, both as a friend and a colleague and someone to read, uh, is, is the fact that for you, philosophy isn't something that's just sort of strictly academic and, 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 and done in the classroom and logic and it, it's as applied to the real world. Why don't you define what you think philosophy is? And I'll tell you what I think I've learned philosophy is from reading you. <laughs> well, I, I always uh, describe it as uh, rational inquiry, thoughtful mm -hmm. inquiry. Uh -huh. And that's what it meant in antiquity. So, you know, the philosophers of ancient times were interested in everything. The very yeah. first philosophers were interested sure. in the structure and properties of the natural world. I yeah. mean, they were, in effect, proto-scientists. Yeah. And um, they were also interested in human nature and in human society and in questions about the best kind of life that we could live and, and, and how we should organize our, our communities so that those best lives can flourish. So, you know, the, the, these questions are very general, but also very deep and, and very central. So I see philosophy as, as rational inquiry. And one has to distinguish uh, between philosophy conceived in that very, very broad way, that, uh -huh. that license to, to be sticking your nose into stuff, on the one hand, and on the other hand, academic philosophy. So in the academy, in the university, we tend to, to just look under the bonnet of the car and tinker with the engine. We don't ever get in the car and drive anywhere. <laughs> yeah. that, that's you know, part, of the, part of the problem in a way. Yeah. But also it's part of the necessary discipline to get people to know what the basic questions are, 
to learn how to explore them with some depth and, and clarity and acuity. And also, if you know something about the historical tra uh, tradition of philosophy, you're not going to keep on reinventing the wheel as a yeah. triangle or something. Sure. As you know, I've had I've been quoted or misquoted about philosophy a variety of times, but I view the connection clearly between philosophy and science as intimate. And uh, there's no there's a real reason science was called natural philosophy, but I also think of science as essentially rational thinking. The, the difference with science is, is experimentation, that you're testing ideas. But basically, I think of science as skeptical thinking, rational thinking, testing experimentally and returning to it. And, and I think of philosophy as the part of science or that one does when one's trying to critically examine the world using rational thinking. And I don't really distinguish, um, in that sense, science from philosophy. Scientists are doing philosophy. We are all doing philosophy. I think that's a important thing to think about but i guess the training is to is to do it rigorously and and i tend to think of your philosophy what it, i was i wrote down what i would think it was was just uh, critical thinking applied to all real world problems but yeah i'd, I'd buy that <laughs> is that right that's about, about right yeah now i've heard you being uh, skeptical about, about <laughs> philosophy <laughs> in, in lectures and other places yeah. plenty of times yeah. um uh, but but i know what your target is because the, the, there is one branch of of philosophy which is highly relativistic and is skeptical about mm -hmm. science and mm -hmm. doesn't believe in what they call grand narratives and so yeah. on and th this tends to be what's sometimes called continental philosophy, or some aspect of it anyway, yeah. uh, and, and where the idea that uh, we can achieve truth, uh, that there is some objectivity in our inquiries about uh, reality, uh, that all these things are, are questioned by them. And naturally enough, that's going to irritate a, an experiment well, <laughs> a scientist. So, so I, I can sympathize with that. But, you know, th th those sorts of questions themselves are interesting because they give us an opportunity to rebut them, so we, we can, we can, you know, we, we've got a, a target that we can, we can really sharpen our teeth on a bit and say, look, if we're going to have a chance of being able to communicate with one another at all, we've got to have common ground. With there's got to be some objectivity out there, and truth, getting to the truth, is a, an ideal of inquiry. It's a target that organizes and disciplines all our efforts to make sense of our world. Well, exactly. But I, I think you hit, the, it's clearly objective truth and people who sort of question it uh, annoy me. But philosophy of science is a real discipline within philosophy. And, it's, and, I, and I respect uh, that, that people do that. What, what, what's interesting to me is, is as a scientist, when I'm told that I can't do science unless I study philosophy of, of science. And that's just... It, it's not. It, it's not a pejorative thing to say that it's just not true. It's just, the mo as I often say, most scientists can't spell philosophy, much less. But but I mean, it seems to me the other thing philosophy can really do is frame questions. It's especially when the, when you don't really don't know what the good questions are, and 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 that's why in physics the good we know what the good questions are, and 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 early on philosophy is quite important. I now think in neuroscience or in, in cognitive science or in consciousness where we really don't understand anything that philosophers can play a key role in trying to be, make us, keep us rigorous and trying to ask what kind of questions are, might be answerable, what are not, and that sort of thing. I, I don't know how you... Yeah, no, no, I think that's, that's right. Uh, very often a characterization of philosophy is that it is the effort to try to write, uh, find what the right questions are so that you can find some way of answering them. And I mean, actually science itself provides a, a brilliant example because the, the, the sorts of questions asked and the way they were answered up until, let's say, Copernicus and Galileo and uh -huh. so on, were just the wrong questions yeah. and, and the wrong, wrong ways of answering them. So as soon as you've identified that, suddenly you, you can make a huge amount of progress. But I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, look, this is a division of labor situation mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, a, a practicing scientist is just going to get on with it. They're yeah. going to theorize or they're going to construct good experiments and so on. And, uh, and and that's great. And look at the immense achievement that's come out of science. It's one of humanity's greatest ever uh, achievements. But you, you could also, you know, sit back and you could reflect on the following kind of situation. Supposing somebody says... Uh, all, all ravens are black. Uh -huh. You probably know this example. Yeah, right? yeah I do. But all ravens are kind of, but all yeah. ravens are black. So all non-black things are non-ravens. Uh -huh. Anything white is not a raven. Anything uh -huh. brown is not a raven, and so on. And this raises a question about relevance. So what counts as relevant evidence? If I wanted to support the ornithological claim that all ravens are black, and I pointed at my shirt and said, look, see, this is evidence that all ravens are black, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wouldn't work. Okay. <laughs> so so there, there is a, a question here about the nature of relevance. If this is just one very, very small mm -hmm. example. 
when you're conducting an experiment, what, uh, um, what, what counts as uh, supporting the hypothesis as being tested, what counts as infirming the, the hypothesis? Obviously, you've got to be able to distinguish between the evidence that, that, that counts yeah, and, that, yeah. and, and the evidence yeah. that doesn't. And that's just an interesting question. So it's one that a, a practicing scientist might uh, speculate on. It's certainly one that a philosopher of science might speculate on, but it's just an interesting uh, and in perhaps in some ways a significant question. And and I think that's the point, that there are there are deep questions that some people need to think about, but... But for most scientists, they just get on with it. And quantum, there's we still may we still don't understand quantum mechanics, but it hasn't stopped us building semiconductors and computers and and changing the world. And so uh, that's okay. No, I agree. And and, and look, you know, there, there are some very important lessons that can be drawn from the the, the great success of, mm. of science. And that is this: uh, I mean, supposing I ask you whether you really know something. Mm -hmm. whether you've absolutely got the final truth uh -huh. about something in science, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there may be one or two things that you feel very, very confident about, but on the whole, you might say, no, no, the point about science is that it's defeasible. You know, yeah. some new evidence might come along or a better argument or more refined experimentation that would show us that we have to adjust the theory or maybe even have to have a whole new one. Absolutely. And, and that, that's really significant because that means that um, the ideals of of truth, mm -hmm. final, absolute mm -hmm. truth and, and of knowledge, kind of miss the point in a way. What the, the, the point really is much more about, about rationality, yeah. where you think that word is really important. The first bit of that word is ratio, proportion. Yeah. So your beliefs and your actions are proportioned to the evidence that you have for them. Mm. And uh, what you believe, what you think, and this applies across the board, politics and religion mm -hmm. and everything else, should be proportional to your, to your evidence. And that, that means that the, um, the, the great endeavor of investigation, of um, getting evidence, of thinking about it, applying it, but being open to changing your mind about it, it is uh, crucial. Mm -hmm. And it runs against all the dogmatism, all those people who swear blind they've got the answer and then they're not going to listen to anything else. So one of the most valuable things that comes out of science is that you can have this incredible triumphant achievement, which is science. We fly in airplanes, yeah. we use computers and, and stuff. But on the other hand, the, the, the people who know about aerodynamics and who built the planes, they say, oh, well, we could be wrong. You know, and that's good. Absolutely. In fact, probably one of... Uh, I'm always interested in people talk about truth because um, one of, I wrote about this in one of my books, but one of the mo most unheralded developments of physics in the last century, although it won a Nobel Prize, was a re sort of a redefinition, the realization there is no such thing as absolute scientific proof. They're literally truth. There, is, there, there isn't that all scientific theories apply in a limited domain. Even the very best theories we have we know we know are wrong at a certain scale. They, but they're absolutely right for the scale they descri they describe, and we don't mind that they're what we call effective. We we've given up. When I was a young person, I certainly I thought, oh yeah, there's absolute truths. There may be absolute truths. It's an interesting question we can talk about. But in science, at least, there's no evidence of that, and uh, and and you know I'm skeptical. Yeah. So the, so the good thing about that is that it teaches us that um, in the quest for Absolute truth. I'm sure, mm. sure there are some. Yeah, we're trying to figure yeah. out how the world works. But, but in the quest for it, the thing that counts is truthfulness, honesty, probity, yeah. integrity, you know, using um, styles of reasoning and thought which are, are, are genuinely cleave to the very best standards that we can apply. So in the quest for truth, we haven't found it, but we can be truthful in our investigation of it. I love that. Okay. Well, look, you know, you've written about so many topics and, and we've discussed together many things, but the, it's clear lately that you're, there's some things that are concerning you that when we, if we talk about philosophy as, as critical theory applied to real world problems, there's some real world problems that, that have been concerning you. I, so I thought I, I sort of, there, the two last books of yours, I know, at least in the United States, there, one is called The Challenge of Things, which is a series of essays about disturbing things about the world and and not so disturbing things about the world. And then one that's even even more bold in its title, Democracy and its Crises. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about both of those. And, and let's start with democracy, because uh, I, I think that we're both agreed that there, there's a huge challenge to democracy right now in both our countries and, and elsewhere around the world. I assume that's probably why you were motivated to think about this. And, and, and this book begins with, with Plato, 
which who I'm a great fan of, so that's okay. Um, I'm not such a great fan of Aristotle, although you keep telling me that I should be more of a fan of Aristotle. But but you talked about Plato, of course, wasn't a big fan of democracy. And in 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 the in the very beginning of chapter one, you say um, the two things that he really was concerned about was one of the dilemmas of democracy, the danger, in his view, the inevitability of democracy, in fact, being, or at least rapidly collapsing into, rule by the least well-equipped to rule. As Plato put it on the basis of how such a process could occur in an ancient Greek city-state mob rule, which the term oklocracy, I never heard of it before, um, was coined. Okay, that would be undesirable in its own right, but he said there was another problem, and it's it's the further inevitability uh, to to create a tyrant, basically, to be unstable and create a tyrant. So first, mob rule, secondly, creative tyrant. And when I read that, of course, I can't help but resonate with that thinking because, of, of course, the modern world seems to me has both of those huge dangers associated with it. So maybe you could talk about the motivation for that book and and, and we'll explore some of the ideas in it a little more. Sure. Well, the trigger for, for writing the book was uh, the Brexit uh, referendum in the UK and the Trump election in the US. And I should say, for the for the Americans, you've been an, uh, an extremely vocal opponent of Brexit here in, in England. But yeah, anyway, sure yes. have, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so the, the, um, the, the, those two events suggested to me that the advent of uh, social media and the difference made to the whole political process and the process of political debate in particular had exposed something, a a time bomb ticking away at the very heart of our our democracies. Um, Because uh, there had been a huge effort made by uh, thinkers all the way from John Locke right the way through the tradition uh, with uh, Baron de Montesquieu mm. and the founders of the US um, and the uh, uh, thinkers in another thinker in France actually a guy called Benjamin Constant yeah. uh, John Stuart Mill here yeah. in the UK p- p- people thinking about how you solve a problem that Plato had identified now Plato in a very very condescending kind of way <laughs> yeah. in a very arrogant way yeah. thought that um, if you put final political authority in the hands of the of the people mm-hmm. because the people are not well informed that they're short termists they're self interested they're prejudiced they they're, they're given to envy and rivalry that if you put a, a, a political power into their hands this is just going to be a mess it's going to degenerate into anarchy you're going to get mob rule ochlocracy is the, uh, and, and the mob rule is insufferable you just can't get anything done people mm. very very quickly get exhausted so they welcome with open arms a tyrant somebody a strong man who will come in and and, and sort things out. So he was very skeptical about democracy, and uh, his strictures on it me- meant that nobody was in favor of democracy for the next 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. Just, people just didn't talk about it. Until at the middle of the 17th century. Mm-hmm. In fact, in the English Civil War, which uh, one, one historian, Christopher Hill, described as the first of the great revolutions that swept across the European and Eurocentric world, mm-hmm. so it includes North America, over the next couple of centuries, it really reconfigured the way that politics and society work. But in that, in that um, uh, revolution, the English Civil War, there was a, a moment when uh, soldiers of the new model army of Cromwell said... They wanted universal adult male suffrage. They wanted regular parliaments. They wanted um, an independent judiciary. Mm-hmm. They wanted to abolish the House of Lords, all that. You know, things mm-hmm. that we would nowadays regard as reasonable uh, claims that a, a Democrat might make. And, of course, they got very short shrift. Mm-hmm. But it, it started to make people think, how, how if on the one hand you have this problem identified by Plato... The, 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 the people, are they really, you know, well-equipped to, to be the source of authority? Mm. And the answer that was worked out by all those guys I mentioned from Locke to John Stuart Mill was, yes, you can, you, can, you can put confidence in the people and say, you know, it's up to you to give consent to government. Mm. If you can devise institutions and practices that will parlay all the variety of preferences and desires and interests into something that counts as good, good enough government for, for everybody and everybody's interest. And this idea they worked out was the idea of representative democracy. Mm-hmm. And representative democracy requires... That um, the that the people elect representatives who are not messenger boys and girls. They're not mm-hmm. delegates. Okay, they go to do a job of work on behalf of the people. Mm-hmm. Get the facts. Get the information. Listen to discussion. Listen to the experts. Form some judgment, um, and then uh, act on that judgment. And if they don't do a good job, then the people can recall them, can sack them mm-hmm. next time, and put somebody in their place. So this is the fundamental idea of a representative democracy. 
And of course, it matters that the way they're elected, the electoral system should be good enough. Uh, it matters that the institutions should be such that you can't, a government can't just keep itself in power indefinitely. There must be limits and constraints on the degree of their power. There must be some transparency and answerability on the part of the people in the institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, these are all reasonably familiar ideas uh, in a constitutional arrangement. Yes. But then it turns out that if you're the people who get themselves, put themselves forward to be representatives and they get into these institutions, if they start to find ways of moving the levers of power a bit, which are just in the interests of their party or themselves, mm -hmm. if they find ways of um, pretending that they're responding to the democratic interests of the people out there, but not really. It's, it's the, the kind of factional interest that, by the way, the writers of the Federalist Papers were very keen to, to try to guard against. Yes. Uh, Mad Madison and Hamilton were very against this idea that you would get partisanship. And they, so they created a set of institutions with these checks and balances, you know, that mm. very mm. familiarly in the mm. states. And you've got the legislature, you've got the executive, you've got the judiciary. And that the powers of these bodies are meant to be separate from one another. Yes. Well, it turns out that, uh, um, firstly, that the electoral system that we have in the UK and in the US, which is just so-called plurality voting, first-past-the-post voting, mm. it's very undemocratic. Yes. It also turns out that things like gerrymandering, you know, yeah. organizing the congressional districts and so on, you can, you can keep a, a congressional district in the hands of a, one party forever if you've got the right arrangement. Moreover, the idea of separation of powers, you certainly have it between Congress and presidency, but you don't have it between the political process and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. You only have to mention the most recent Supreme yeah. Court appointment to see that it's an entirely political matter. Yeah, yes. And, yeah. And, and it's kind of under the radar because in the last couple of years of the Obama administration, any number of appeal court seats around mm -hmm. the various appeal court districts in the US, when they fell vacant, uh, the appointments that Obama wanted to make to them were blocked mm -hmm. by the Senate Judiciary Committee, which was under Republican mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. And the minute that Trump came into power, Mitch McConnell and his mm -hmm. uh, uh, cronies in, yeah. in the in Senate just started to fill them up yeah. with young Republican appeal court judges yeah. who are going to be there forever and, yeah. and they're going to change the character of American society. So, I mean, I'm just giving you now one no, practical sure. example of how this brilliant idea of representative democracy has, has kind of been polluted. But the, I mentioned that the very worst pollution of it is social media. So mm. by, by, by the use of Twitter and Facebook and, and uh, robots and, mm. and, you know, putting massive amount of, of uh, misinformation into, into social media, what had been a commonplace of politics, which is propaganda, spin, false information, misleading sure. information, that, that's always been in politics. Yeah, sure. But now so it's been... Part of politics. Yeah, it's now been weaponized. By, yeah. by by social media, of course we picked up on it pretty damn quickly. But it it really it really made a big difference in in, uh, in 2016. That that was a kind of crucial year in a way. And it needs to be explained to people how this works, just very very briefly. Okay, okay? sure. No, go on, go on, Matt. You've got in any election or any referendum, you've got the yes, no, mm -hmm. Clinton, Trump, uh, in out, mm -hmm. whatever yeah, it might yeah. be. Okay, so you've got two blocks of people who have pretty well made up their minds, and very probably they're going to tune out of the campaigns, bores them, they know how they're going to vote. Yeah. But in between those two blocks, there's a group of people who maybe haven't made up their minds or who could have their minds changed or mm -hmm. who could be acted upon in some way. Mm -hmm. And if you can get just enough of those people, you don't even have to get all of them, yeah. but just get enough of them to move one direction or the other. Because remember, all referendums, all elections are won on very small margins. Yeah. So if you can target those people, if you can lie enough to those people, if you mm -hmm. can spend enough money on adverts that you know will really, really hit with those people. And we know, we know that, you know, all these social media platforms are expert at micro-targeting people. They monitor all our activity. They know what interests us and bothers us. So they, they can micro-target little groups of people and aggregate them all with the right kind of advertising. So this has undermined the, the democratic process now. And it's vital that in going back uh, to how we organize our uh, democratic processes, that we've got to find a way of dealing with that and we've got to refresh our democracies. Otherwise, we're just going to fall into the hands of, uh, of cliques or, or groups who have happened to have had the most uh, uh, effect through these, these means. Well, okay, that's a great summary, and 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 and, and let's let's pick apart some of the issues because because uh, as I say, you've gone everywhere I wanted to go, but 
first, actually, I let you, uh, I agree with you, but but I per- should have perhaps asked you to elaborate. When you say that our voting system isn't democratic, maybe you can explain what you mean by that, because okay. I know what you, I, th- I know, I think I know what you're talking sure. about. But. Okay, so for the House of Representatives in the U.S. and for the House of Commons in the U.K., we use what's called a plurality system or a mm-hmm. first past the post system. Yeah. Okay, so just to give you an example, supposing you've got a congressional district with 100 voters mm-hmm. and 10 people stand for election. Mm -hmm. And eight of them get 10 votes each. And Mm. one gets nine votes. And the last gets 11 votes. He's the guy who goes to Congress, representing 11 people out of 100. The other 89 are completely unrepresented. There's no representation there. And from this simple fact, which shows that our systems of of election are undemocratic, and by the way, the elections to the Senate, you know, are proportional to the number of states, not the number of people in yeah, them. Yeah. Then the Electoral College, which exists, you know, to stop some idiot, ignorant, bloviating Yeah, it didn't fool. work very well. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so you can see that all the other institutions of the of the U.S. are even more remote than that. But but right there uh, in the system for of representation, you've got a very distorting voting system. Leave aside even the fact of gerrymandering. Yeah. To, to, to get a, a more proportional uh, system of election, which really does reflect the variety of preferences and choices, will probably result in the failure of the two-party system. Um, in almost all countries that have the first-past-the-post-voting po- system have a two-party system, and power swings between the two parties. And, and the result of that is that whoever happens to control the party, the clique, the group at the top mm-hmm. of that party, or the activists in the country who uh, you know, determine party policy, are the people who run the country. Whereas if you have proportional representation, you tend to get coalition governments. Mm-hmm. So you can look at places like Germany and, and others where they have good uh, systems of proportional representation, or you look at places like Italy and Israel where they have bad ones. So mm-hmm. in the bad ones, you get very small minorities over-influencing policy. But, but where you've got the right kind of system and it really works, what tends to happen is that it drains politics out of government. Mm-hmm. Instead, of the, instead of government being highly yeah. politicized, all the politics happens in elections and then in the negotiations between the different parties who are going to constitute the coalition. And then, and then you, so, so, so you get a kind of consensus emerging and then there's government. And government should be for all the people, people, not just the people who voted for a particular party. That's what this says, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that, that's what it says in the preamble <laughs> yeah. to the U.S. Constitution, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the people, the whole people. Yeah, yeah. So so it, it's, it's incredibly important that we should look at, at the way that uh, our system has, in fact, evolved, de facto, mm-hmm. the, in, in practice evolved, and how recent events have kind of ripped the cover off it and said, look, it's just dysfunctional. It, well, it is. I, I, it's clearly, it, it, it seems to be. And I, I noticed in the book, I mean, we're both sympathetic uh, because we've spent time in Australia, but there's two aspects of uh, elections in Australia that that I, uh, I admire. Um, one, you mentioned in the book, which is that uh, every, you're required to vote. You, you're fined if you don't vote because it's an obligation as a citizen, like paying taxes, like anything else. It's, a, it's part of the social contract, as Rousseau would have said, Right now in the United States, a, a highly competitive election, one that generates a lot of voting, may have 40% of the, of the population actually voting, 60% not voting, speaking of your, of your example of, of 100 people. So even if you run a, a vast plurality of that 40%, you're still not necessarily representing the, the population. But the other is a, 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 um, a system that I, I, I took me a while to understand, but I don't know. I'd like to hear what you think about it. It's not a first-past-the-post system. You, you vote for somebody. You also say who you want your votes to go to if that person isn't leading. And, and it's sort of basically you give a series of, of what happens to your vote. So it's not wasted. In the United States, for example, when there's a close election— um, you know, if Ralph Nader's running and 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 Al Gore's running, and and people who may be sympath- very sympathetic to uh, Ralph Nader w- don't want to vote for him because they're taking a vote away and potentially handing the election to to someone else. But if but in the Australian system, you could vote for Ralph Nader, saying this is the person I like the best. But if he only gets five percent of the vote, um, I want my vote to go to Al Gore, and that seems to me to be a uh, a more rational system. I don't know whether what. Uh... Oh, I agree with you absolutely. I mean, you know, you talk about it being a rational system. Of course, it's a rational system. <laughs> yeah. It's called the alternative vote system. Yeah. So you, you rank your your preferences. You don't have uh, it in Engl- in England, do you? Well, no, we don't have it for elections to the House of Commons. Uh-huh. But we we have we have all sorts of different proportional representation systems, including including the alternative vote system, for 
for all sorts of different other uh, um, areas of our democracy. So, for example, the devolved assemblies of Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland, uh. they're on that kind of system. Uh, elections for the European Union, they're on that kind of system. Uh. Even in the House of Commons itself, elections for chairman of House committees are on oh, a proportional uh, system. So it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's not as our politicians don't know it exists, but it's in their interest yes, of course. to hang on to the other one yeah. because they can get big majorities in the House of Commons on very small minorities of the popular vote. Oh, and and, that's and then gerrymander things or or manipulate the media to maintain that. Uh, uh, it's certainly an incumbent. I, I assume it's the same in, in England, but just being an incumbent automatically gives you a great advantage in the sure. United States. So that tends to push that forward. Now, there's another aspect of that. Well, you know, I was reading as you go from Plato to Locke to Hobbes, Rousseau, and, and the whole different definitions of what democracy is. And and this notion that ultimately, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is reflected, as you say, in the separation of powers, which isn't very effective, especially if it becomes political, when because it becomes disabling. You just can't do anything. It's, not, it's what's happening in the United States, at least. You, well, you know, you know, I mean, look, look, in fact, the problem is even worse in a way because m- many, over 50 Mm -hmm. Uh, democracies around the world derive from what's called the Westminster model. Mm -hmm. Actually, the United States uh, uh, arrangement is itself a version of the Westminster model, although it's it's, uh, closer to the original Lockean conception than than happened later. Uh, It's an interesting little little bit of history. So so what happened here was that... um, until until 1688, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, uh, the the idea was that a king ruled by divine right. Divine it was God right, yeah, who had appointed yeah. who was going to be the king. Okay, uh, so um, but because of what happened with the Catholics and the Protestants and the abdication of uh, James II from the English throne, Parliament took over and said, "No, we're going to be God here. We're going to appoint the <laughs> yeah, king." So yeah. they invited William of Orange to yeah. come and be King William of England. Uh-huh. And the, the idea was that uh, there's the king and the king is the executive power. Then there's the House of Lords and the House of Commons and these are the legislative power. And then there's a judiciary. So you've got four institutions, which um, Montesquieu uh, was uh, a great admirer of. And as a result, both of Locke and of Montesquieu, the founders of the United States said, yeah, we've got to have these four separate institutions. Mm-hmm. So we've got to have an executive as president. Mm-hmm. You've got to have a Senate and you've got to have a House of Representatives. You've got to have a judiciary. So they're the four and they're going to check and balance one another. Unfortunately, if you have a bipartisan uh, um, politics, that'll work. Yeah. But unfortunately, if you don't, if yeah. you have two parties which are deeply opposed to one another, these four institutions are just going to paralyze uh, one another. Yeah. And you get paralysis in the US every single time a budget has to be agreed. You yeah. come to the 11th yeah. hour and so yeah. on. So you, you, you can see where, where it all goes wrong. So the. Uh, and you, you've, you're getting. Uh, I certainly am more aware of that in the United States. I was never as aware of it in Britain. But I guess, you, I assume right now we're seeing with Brexit more or less paralysis happening. Well, yeah, sure, that, that's paralysis, but only because there's no majority in the House of Commons. If there were, there wouldn't be. It would just be railroaded through. So here's the problem. Uh, when this this arrangement uh, was instituted after 1688, uh, all looked fine and dandy until 1715 when a new king came he happened to be a German who didn't speak English. This is George I. Oh. And because he didn't speak English, he didn't attend cabinet. He didn't oh. act as an executive. Oh, I see. So the executive started to be whoever could command a majority in the House of Commons. Oh. This meant that the separate, supposed separation of powers between the executive and the legislature collapsed, and the legislature became the creature of the executive. No, if you if you if the executive is drawn from the majority, the majority belongs to you. Yeah. So you as the executive can do what the hell you like. Yeah. And that that's the situation which is obtained not just in England and Britain and the UK as it evolved over the next couple of centuries, but in every polity, New Zealand, Australia, India, mm-hmm. Canada, South Africa, anywhere you can think of, which used to be part of the British Empire. And all of them have this failure of the separation of powers. Uh, and, and and it's a time bomb because in 1865, John Stuart Mill published a book called Representative Government. Uh-huh. And in it, he said, um, recognizing that the constitution of, of uh, Britain was pretty dodgy, that uh-huh. the executive could do what they had it liked, he said, we have, fortunately, we have what's called constitutional morality. This is the self-restraint of people in power <laughs> who behave like gentlemen. They won't do the, the, the wrong thing, okay? <laughs> 
But well, well, when you stop getting gentlemen in yeah. power, you know, yeah. when you start getting the people we've got in Parliament today in the yeah. UK or people like Trump and so on, they're not going to be restrained. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to use every constitutional lever available to them. And if these levers are incredibly powerful because there's no ultimately no check, you know, the executive is meant to be answerable to the legislature. Yeah. But if it owns the legislature, then it's not advanceable yeah, to it. Exactly. So this is the problem uh, that, that, that exists, and it exists in all those different countries I've mentioned, Canada, New Zealand, yeah. Australia, etc. And it's a time bomb. But so, yeah. so, you know, there's got to be deep reform. And, and so far as the United States of America is concerned, yes, you do have separation between the presidency and Congress, but you've got that problem of a failure of separation between the political process and the judiciary, and that's well, very serious. And Well, yeah, it's interesting that you, you – it's, it's interesting from your perspective because, uh, well, I grew up in Canada, so I grew up in a parliamentary system, and then, and then I, I moved to the United States. And there's something about the parliamentary system that se- just seems more sensible to me in, inherently – you know, in the United States, we spend two years, waste two years and billions of dollars electing a president. Where in, in parliamentary democracies, you really, you never vote for the prime minister, you vote for your local representative. And things, it's the sense I always got growing up and then in experiencing the United States is that the United States was based on a distrust of government, a, a sense that government was not, that, that could not be trusted and, and it would not act in your favor. And, and every, you had to put checks and balances everywhere to assure that government would intru- wouldn't intrude on your freedom. May- and it probably is a legacy, of, of course, of their experience with Britain. Whereas parliamentary democracies, at least in my experience, are based on the idea, well, government is really there to take care of you. And we'll kind of trust, we'll trust the politicians, we'll elect these people, they'll, they'll elect their own prime minister and they'll work on our behalf. So you've got this trust system and this distrust system. And I used to think that the trust systems work better, except for what I'm seeing in, in now. And But I don't know if you want to reflect... Well. Uh, you, you, you wonderfully articulate the, the 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 attitude that I think most people have had most of the time mm-hmm. about our parliamentary democracies in the UK and Canada and places yeah, yeah. like that. You know, we've been sold and we've bought and yeah. we've believed uh, that the fact that it is a pretty benign system. Mm-hmm. Turns out, <laughs> looking at recent events, that is not that, yeah. that benign. Yeah. And, and my, my feeling really is that what's happened in the UK in 2016 and since is a big red flag for all those Westminster model democracies around the world because they should yeah. all be saying to themselves, could that happen here? Yeah. You know, look, and, and, and they've got to think about, they've got to think about this, okay? So activists, party political activists out there in the country are very, very few, but very vocal and very influential sure. because they're the ones who choose who's going to be a representative, mm-hmm. who's, who's going to stand for parliament. Then in, in the political party itself, when, when it gets into parliament, so there may be, say, 300 of them or 250 yeah. of them, very few of them are going to be at the very top. Who are they? Yeah. They are going to be the ones who are you know, the most effective operators, who have the most support among the activists or sure. who are the smartest. So in the end, it turns out that, th- that these democracies, which seem so benign, and we seem like democracies, despite the, the the lousy electoral system and so on, are actually run by oligarchies. They're really hidden oligarchies. Sure. And and the lack of transparency about them is precisely what has made people feel, just as, as you've articulated it. Uh, oh, it's okay. It's kind of benign. It works all right. Well, we'll get to. I know that you you the good thing about this particular book and discussions is you don't just present the problems. I think you try and talk about some solutions. We'll get which we'll get to, but. I was I was taken when you talked about de Tocqueville and others about this dile- dilemma of democracy, achieving democracy while ensuring stable government. And I was I- interested when you said, um, I- "Is representative democracy, you know, a success?" And you said the answer is slightly slightly qualified, no. And apparently, and I forget which of the philosophers or his, that you or th- deep thinkers you were talking about talked about this issue of, of populism versus dem- uh, demagoguery. And, and of course, in the United States, we're seeing exactly that, the combination of populism leading to a, a potential tyrant or someone who wishes or acts like he was a tyrant. I mean, the, th- the thing about the relationship between populism and demagoguery is that they, are, they need one another. It's a, it's a paras- mutually parasitic. You, you, there's a wonderful phrase I, I wrote down of yours. You said, populist sentiment is an element in which demagogues swim. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because, because, you know, look, if you're poor, if you're out of work, if you're um, you know disenfranchised uh, by by society, you're not really fully participating. You can't get access to all the social goods that mm-hmm. uh, you know are important in society. You, you're in a very enfeebled position. 
So mm-hmm. if, to imagine the masses getting together and rising up as a, a populist whole is, is a bit of a myth. Yeah. It takes a demagogue to come along and say to these people, you're in trouble and I know the answer to it. Yeah. If you will vote for me or, or follow me or rise up with me, then I'm going to solve all your problems for you. This is the demagogue. This is not the person who is going to you know, solve their problems uh, uh, easily because nobody yeah. can, but but he's going to promise that he can do it, okay? Yeah. And and this is where you get uh, uh, populism really depending upon the, the demagogue to get itself going and, and to make a big difference. And that can really rock the boat a lot. I talked about the two groups and the, and the, the you know, the portion in between. Yes. Where, when you get uh, populism upsurging as we're getting in, uh, in Europe today, uh, that really does shift things in that center ground in a way which is very destabilizing. The trouble is that the lack of depth in the discussion, the lack of information. Um, part of the problem is that our press, you know, the more responsible newspapers, newspapers like the New York Times, Washington Post, the Guardian newspaper, uh, independent newspaper here, who try to discuss the issues and explore them a little bit and get the facts out there for people. They're read by very, very few people, relatively speaking. And it's it's uh, social media and it's, it's uh, popular programming that gets out slogans. So instead of yeah. analysis, you get slogans. Instead of proper policies worked out, you, 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 you just you get, get tweets. You just get tweets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this, this is very corrupting of the process and very easy to capture by anybody who has a knack for getting the right tweets or the yeah. right slogans out there. Populism, in, when I, for me, didn't have a negative connotation. I mean, pure populism sounds good. And, and you mentioned, I mean, the Arab Spring was an example of populism. And that at least from from external observer, the idea of the Arabs of populism rising in in Arab countries seemed like a very good thing. So it's just it's just if it's exploited, and maybe there are counterexamples you know of, but at least the ones you list are not counterexamples. Populism inevitably, as you say, leads to someone who can say who can exploit and tap into that populist sentiment. It doesn't seem to lead to a to a representative democracy. See, I I don't see what happened in Arab Spring as a case of populist uprisings. Okay, good. You t- take Egypt as an example. The people who appeared in Tahrir Square yeah. and, and uh, complained about uh, Mubarak, who was yeah. in, in power at the time, were middle-class, educated, younger people. Uh-huh. And the people who were in the vanguard of a revolution of that kind are not the people who inherit the revolution. Yeah. Because Egypt is in a worse place now than it was oh, before sure. then. Yeah. What they do is they topple a tyrant and then, you know, there's a, a, a kind of anarchy ensues. <laughs> this is yeah. Plato at work here. Yeah. And then you get an even stronger guy who comes in and takes over. So exactly they lose out. So in in uh, in the in Egypt, you have a classic example of how um, a, a, a move against tyranny, a move for democracy, a move for greater freedom, which is what those those sort of educated and, uh, uh, types wanted, um, can unseat a, a tyrant and can destabilize the situation in a way that makes an even worse tyranny come into yeah, play. Yeah, but isn't that sad? Because, I mean, w- one of the things that that I find attractive uh, when I try and be optimistic about what's happening now is that I see young people being, uh, if not radicalized, beginning to protest about everything from climate change to other things. And and having grown up in the 60s, to me, that just seems like a getting young people involved in the system, especially since they're going to grow up and become part of it, and be willing to protest and be willing to be to complain is a good thing. But is it? Should we say no? We shouldn't encourage that because oh, no, it will no. lead to it will lead to destabilizing tyrants. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I, I think it, I think it is a great thing. I think yeah. it is a great thing. Uh, in, in situations like the one obtaining in Egypt, it's it's more difficult for those people, the young the young people, mm-hmm. to, to to get where they want to go because the forces against them are so great. In our situation, the US or in the UK or anywhere in, in Europe, I think the, the young people of our, our countries are absolutely the hope for the future. They should absolutely be out there on the streets. They should be as active politically as they, they possibly can they be the because they're, they're our hope for the future. There's no question about that. But it brings me back to a point you mentioned. You said that I'd written that I gave a, a qualified no to yeah. the question, is representative yeah. democracy? I said, is a representative democracy working? In fact, I believe in representative democracy. If you could get it right, if you could make sure that those um, electoral systems, uh, systems of representation, the kind of people, the quality of people we elect 
uh, mm -hmm. and put them in those institutions. The transparency of those institutions, if we could get those things right, yeah. and in fact, I don't think it would take too much to do that. It would take relatively minor reforms to, to get those things right. Then we could get what, what I describe in the book as good enough government. Good, I mean, yeah. I use that phrase because you know, it's never going to be perfect. There are always going to be problems and so on. Well, the perfect should never be the enemy or whatever the word. Exactly. Right? You probably know. Yeah. Perfect should not be the enemy of the good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if we can get good enough government. Actually, going back to Aristotle, yeah. guy you don't like and the one I do like. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, by the way, on Aristotle. Science is, is you know, pretty well, crap. He, he so got, yeah, he got a bad name, especially when Galileo made fun of him. He did, but, his teeth yeah. and so on, yeah. And, then never, and in fact, it was his science that people were really... Uh, fed up with, but there are so many other things about yes. Aristotle. He was so universal. Okay, but he, in, in writing about politics, one thing he said that was good was he said government should be sufficient, and by that he meant that it really should answer to the needs of the community as a whole. It, mm -hmm. it should be something which is not just a function of, 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 of party or, or of mm -hmm. a class or of money or of one religion or something, you know, um, dominating everybody else. But the idea of sufficient or what I call good enough government, and I'm sure you can get that out of the system, but you can only get it out of the system if you, if, if you, if you do those sort of minor reforms that I was talking about, but also make people alert to the, to the fact that if you don't participate you know, mm -hmm. and our first-past-the-post system mm -hmm. stops people participating because yeah. they don't think their vote's going to count. And they're dead right. If you vote for the losing candidate, it doesn't count yeah. for a damn thing. It, yeah. it, it means zero. So that, that stops people from participating. But if, they, if you felt that your vote made a difference, you would take more of an interest. You would read the paper, you would listen to the news, you would turn up at the, at the voting booth. It's a scandal that in a country like the United States of America, uh, the turnout should be 40%. That's just a scandal. And that's a good election. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a scandal. It should be 60, 70 more it's, percent, you know, because when you mentioned uh, um, Australia with uh, compulsory mm -hmm. um, participation, mm -hmm. but by the way, there's a bit of a nuance there. One is you don't actually have to vote. Well, you, you have, have to, to turn up. You have You've to got turn to show up. up. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Exactly. So you can destroy your paper and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you don't turn up, the fine is not really all that big. It mm. should be bigger. It should be like your fine for not paying your taxes. Yeah, because yeah. as you say, it's a civic obligation yeah. and a really important it's one. It's one of the most important, but people don't, don't put any energy into it. Yeah, yeah. What, what really gets me is people died to get the vote. I mean, for mm -hmm. centuries, the struggle mm -hmm. to be able to participate, to be able to have a voice in choosing mm -hmm. the government and the laws under which you will live. And now people just, they, they just take it so for yeah. granted or, or, or they don't even bother. Once you have something, it's, you know, it, it, you take it for granted. It's like, yeah. it's like getting your PhD. It seems so important until you, so you have it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, or anything. Uh, I, I think it is perhaps the least appreciated freedom that pe that people have in a democracy. Yeah. And, and you know, you talked about ways to make it better. But one of the things that you point out, which is, uh, and I wanted to ask you about Britain because I, I know what's the situation in the United States, but it's, it's I think you referred to it as pay to sway. The interesting thing is, and, and you made the point quite clear that elections, be it Brexit or for, for president or, or, or for Congress even usually, are won by, by pluralities that are very minor. And that... Um, that you can manipulate a few people, and it's been recognized. You, if you put money into it, and focus it, as little as four hundred thousand dollars will will make the difference in election. And that's a very small investment for a very big payoff down the road. If you if you then it can sure. manipulate laws to 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 for any number of reasons. The, one of the biggest uh, concerns or tragedies, at least uh, many of us think in the United States, is a Supreme Court judgments that that basically took away limits on on spending on campaigns so that you, while, while there are pro forma limits on what you can spend on a candidate, you can create a, an organization that basically supports the candidate and put any amount of money into it, which which a number of co people do, literally put These billions. These super of, packs, right? Yeah, yeah super packs yeah. and the Koch brothers. And are in, in the UK, are there, uh, right now, it just money is what determines, and it's well known, you can demonstrate it Clearly, the, the the empirical evidence is the more it's spent, the more likely you're going to win. And and uh, um, what is it in, like in England? Is it well? I mean, you, you raise a very sore point here because uh, we have an electoral commission which imposes limits on how much can be spent in an election, and they have to be transparent. You've got to declare all the money that you're spending on the election, and there's a ceiling. And in fact, in the 2016 referendum, that ceiling was breached big time by the people on the Leave uh, side. They were prosecuted by the Electoral Commission and they were found guilty. And yet, 
the results but, of the- and, and yet the result stands. You know why? Because the, the referendum was technically speaking only advisory. If it had been binding, it would have been voided. It would have been null and void. So, I mean, you know, the, the, this is the kind of crazy situation where the people who want Brexit, and there's a cabal of them, mm-hmm. and, you know, they're, they're on the right wing of the Conservative mm-hmm. Party, and, they're, and for quite different reasons, they're on the far left wing of mm-hmm. the Labour Party. So the far right and the far left both want this, and it's in neither of their interests to really push on the fact that there were these illegalities in in the Leave vote. So this is another example of, you see, a a constitution, a good constitution, a Mm. good political order would have clarity and consistency Mm -hmm. and transparency. Every referendum which has been held in this country, the UK, since 1975, has been held on a different basis. Some have had a threshold requirement, some haven't. Some have said they're going to be binding, some not. You know, that just shows you that whoever is going to run the referendum has got choices about how they can run it to make sure that they get the outcome they yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. And this is this is unhealthy in our society, and it's an, yet another example of the way we've got to have another look at at our our systems. I think I think you, this is your quote, but no form of democracy can protect itself from oglocracy or being hijacked by a tyrant unless um, uh, the franchise, the ones who are enfranchised, are informed and reflective. So ultimately, you're, I think you're saying something that that is very important, and I, it seems to me I've argued in print too that we, democracy fails uh, in the presence of ignorance. It, it, that we we need an informed electorate. Otherwise, the whole thing collapses. And that's the heart of this. But, how, but now the question, that's nice to say and it's easy to say. The question is, how do you, what can you do to ensure an informed electorate? What can, what can we do? What can you and I do? What can others do to try and, and ensure an informed electorate? So, okay, so one has to dig into this just a little bit. Firstly, the idea that the electorate is uh, uninformed or ill-informed mm-hmm. or only partially informed mm-hmm. relates to the, the, the point that very many people um, busy with their lives, their mm-hmm. careers, their families, and so on. Then sure. we haven't got time to dig into the details. Mm-hmm. So, so, so to say of them that they are, are, are not very well informed about the details of some kind of policy issue is just to say something true. It's not to say something negative or, or yeah, critical sure. about them. Yeah. Um, but what one can also mention, and it's a significant point, this, that quite a lot of the choices and preferences that people have are predicated on how they feel about things. So mm-hmm. the, the sort of emotional motivations that they have for voting one way rather than another are also quite important as well. So let's let's just, you know, be grown up about this and accept that uh, people are going to have only partial information and also they're going to have certain attitudes or outlooks that, that are going to influence the way they behave. This is precisely the point of a representative democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've got all the different feelings and and all different patchiness of information out there. You know, if if nevertheless the people who are sent to do the job of government are people who are going to get the facts and and be responsible, be rational, think, reflect, listen to argument, really Mm. take on board what people with some expertise uh, have to say about things. You know, one of the worst moments of the Brexit campaign in this country was when one of the Brexiters said, oh, we've had too much of experts. And and the experts have been saying, if you do this thing, you're going to tank our economy, you're going (laughs) to crash it, you know, which is kind of what's happened already, even though Brexit itself hasn't yet happened and probably won't. But this idea that that representatives are, are sent by us and paid by us to do a job of work on our behalf is no different from the idea of making sure your airline pilot is properly Mm. trained or your surgeon knows knows his job or her job. You know, these are really important points. Uh, And if you you fail to uh, recognize the importance of having these structures, these institutions which are meant to be working in our interest, and if you allow those institutions to be hijacked in the way that they have, then... The, 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 the people out there are going to be very ill-served. And I think, you know, what's happening in, in the United States today, what's happening in the UK today, and what could easily happen in so many mm. of our fellow democracies in the world mm. today is is illuminated by this. Yeah, it's, well, absolutely. It's, it's it, the same thing happens in the United States, of course. That you see the effort to exclude experts. So the people who... who 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 can prov- not make the decisions, but can provide the data that that the representatives should use to make the decisions, mm-hmm. and uh, that they're exclu- typically excluded. Uh, you know, the, one of the first things the Trump government did was to remove scientists from advisory boards uh, in in the case of climate change and put in lobbyists. And 
if you make your decisions based on, on, on dogma or bias, as we'll get to in a bit, you can't help but make decisions that are, that are poor decisions because they don't reflect. The, as you point out, the wonder of, about science in some ways is that it, 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 can, it can produce things, but it also makes predictions that we can test that, that work. And if you just if you go against that evidence, so we 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 can predict that you're going to make bad decisions, and and it's a it's a sad thing. So in for I and mean, that's why it's important to have dialogues like ours. But I I think more generally uh, to think about ways, especially in a world governed by an internet that's that that doesn't filter, and for an educational system that doesn't yet teach children how to filter in the internet. Then, then we have this problem because you know there's a really important point there because uh, there are moves afoot that have been for some time already, but they're kind of gaining strength to put those filters on the internet. Governments, you know, wanting to uh, limit what people can get access oh, to I, on the internet. Uh, people do it in China and all that already. Self, yeah, I know, but I worry about that because someone's yeah. going to filter. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So uh, the, the, this is an anxiety uh, to me because I think it would be better if the internet were just, uh, you know, allowed to be a, a, an anarchy. We should we should approach it from the other end. Yeah. That is, our education system should make people very good at, at discriminating and being uh, uh, critical and, and being selective and knowing how to deal with information, check it and, and so on. Maybe, maybe train it philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> By the way, apropos of what you were saying about um, the administration getting rid of uh, expertise and replacing mm. them with lobbyists, you know, that, that's the usual trend. I remember years and years ago, I had a boss who was a retired Royal Air Force officer, and he told me that in the RAF, they had a saying, which was, have the experts on tap, but not on top. That's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, and that's the way, that's the way it should be. But I, I, I think... Ultimately, I, I, you know, there's an old saying that if the only um, tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Sure. And and as an educator, I guess I've always said this, but I, it seems to me ultimately the solution to these problems is education. We have to figure out a better way, and we're, I don't think we're doing it. I don't think we're 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 designing an educational system right now that is appropriate for the 21st century, dominated by an internet. We're not. We're teaching a bunch of facts. We're not teaching kids how to discern carefully what they read and how to test it internally, if for, both for internal consistency and then to check, because that's going to be much more important to them than, I mean, they'll always, you have your iPhone or whatever to, any facts you need are there. So you don't have to remember as many things as you did before, but the ability to discern what are the facts and what's nonsense, that's the real problem. No, absolutely. And that's the problem of democracy. How, how, how to evaluate uh, where to go and get, uh, where to find um, what will help you to check what you've yeah. been told or what's been claimed or something. These are skills and abilities that lie at the very heart of what an educational process should produce. Now, it, when people are trained as scientists, you know, th this is this is just part of the equipment. They've got to be able to do this. They've got to be able to look at the oscilloscope or, or the yeah. outcome of experiment or something and, and, and make sense of it in the right kind of way. But this applies generally in life. Yeah. It applies to absolutely everything, you know, who you're going to marry, who yeah. you're going to vote for. I mean, all this requires evaluation and no more so than in the internet because I, I describe the internet as the biggest, uh, washroom wall in history. Okay, people can <laughs> scribble their graffiti on it. They can say anything. There's a load of rubbish on it. There's a load of, yeah. of ugliness on it. There's racism. There's there's hatred. There's also a lot of good stuff. And the the point is that the hatred and the racism and the bad stuff it always threatens to drive out the good stuff. The, yeah. the the thing which is valuable about the internet, the instant access to information, opinion, debate, and so on, which is so important. So rather than close down the internet or, or stop putting filters on it, let Let's, let's empower people to be really good at yeah. making good use of the internet. Absolutely. And and to be fair, it was nice of you to talk about science, teach you to do that, but to return the favor, it, it's, science doesn't have a monopoly on that. Philosophy, history, any, I mean, part of what we teach in any academic discipline is this, is this ability in some sense to discern, to distinguish, to critically examine. And that's why I view all of education as really, you you choose what, 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 resonates with you as an individual and what you enjoy but the lessons you learn from it are very similar no matter whether whether you choose philosophy or, or physics or or literature or history or chemistry it, it's it's to be able to reflect accurately about the world and make decisions that are that are appropriate ones and by the way that's why i will say it, we're sitting here in the in new college of humanities and what's one of the reasons why i'm very happy to be a a, 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 vet, a professor, visiting professor here it, periodically because you make a point of all the humanities students here have a course in, in sort of scientific analysis so that they're exposed to this other 
this way of thinking that 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 I that I think we should all uh, we all need to be literate and and responsible citizens in a democracy. Oh, there's no question about that. Scientific literacy is key. It's got to be part of the central component of what an educated person is. Yeah. What 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 to what what it means to be educated. But on the other hand, you know, the, thinking about the humanities. So as you say, we're in the new college of the humanities here. The thing that I believe about the humanities is that it constitutes a great conversation mm -hmm. that humankind has had with itself for, for a couple of thousand years or more. Mm -hmm. And the things that, that are of value, the things that have survived and have been significant in that great conversation are things that respect incredibly high standards mm -hmm. of thought, of insight, uh, of creativity. And every single one of us who studies the humanities, all my students here, for example, are inheritors of this. They inherit this this great tradition where these standards really matter. They're given a key, a key to a gate that, that lets them into a country where they become citizens of, 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 of a universal order with these, <laughs> these people in it. It's just a fabulous idea when you think yeah. about it. And anybody who takes it seriously, who really reads and thinks and debates with, with attention, with focuses their mind on it, asks themselves really good questions about it, they're, they're, they're going to get out of it things that help to shape them and shape their responses. We're not in the business of teaching people what to think about anything. Yeah. We're here to help yeah. them become those good evaluators, those really good, uh, acute, uh, you know, critical inspectors of what other people claim. They're going to become, I hope, very good at being able to, to make a case which is persuasive mm -hmm. for something that they really believe in and think is right. You know, th these things matter. Well, so not, not to teach typically what, what to think, but rather how to think. How to think. And and that leads me nicely to... to uh, to a quote, I think, from George Bernard Shaw that I got from you, which, which relates to the, one of the problems of democracy and allowed us to move into another topic. He said, many people would rather die than think, and most people do. <laughs> That's Bertrand Russell. Uh, yes, yeah. Bertrand Quite Russell. Right. Was Bertrand yeah. Russell was one of yeah. those British people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good remark, that, isn't it? Yeah, and in fact, I have a portrait of Russell hanging in the hallway of my, of my college yeah. to yeah. remind people of that saying. It's Nobody's going to step yeah. into this college and, and die without thinking. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but I, and when I read that, when I, when I was reminded of that quote, which I'd heard before, most people would rather die than think, and most people do, I couldn't help but think of religion. <laughs> because it seems to me, ultimately, that's exactly what people do they die without thinking and call it religion. So maybe we can make a segue to that <laughs> sure. from democracy to, to an area where we both uh, written about. And in fact, when, when, I, when I look at your other book, which was written before, earlier, before Brexit and Trump, uh, the challenges of things, um, you're looking at issues and you were concerned, at, as was rightly the case then, before these most recent crises, the big crises was the clash of cultures, the rise of of, uh, of fundamentalism and and its potential challenges around the world, which which certainly uh, arose and is, and continues to be an issue. Um, and 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 you write about it there, but I th I thought we could talk about that a little bit. I, you wrote a you talked a lot about religion and education, and there was a quote from the Archbishop of Canterbury, which boy I found chilling, which said. So, um, is it something like teaching children is like engraving in stone. And, and doesn't that really get the point of, of why, for many of us, uh, religious education is child abuse. Oh, if, if it weren't for, for indoctrination of, of young, defenseless, uncritical minds, yeah. religion just couldn't survive. I mean, anybody who came to any of the scriptures of the world, uh, untainted by religion, at the age of 20, let's say, just yeah. read them, you know, <laughs> can you imagine everybody saying, wow, this is really good stuff, I'm going to believe. I mean, it's just not on, you know. So you, you're not, that's not going to happen unless you can get in there really early uh, and have that effect, engrave on stone. Yeah, no, no, it's it's uh, it's well, and it's well known, and I think that's for for many people who intellectually recognize the ridiculousness of the, of the world scriptures. But when it's been forced down your throat as a child, it's very hard to give that up. And it it is remarkable, that, and we will be pilloried for for saying it's nonsense by some groups. But just simply questioning, and this is the real problem in my mind. I don't, you know, there's fundamentalism and extremism, and of course, many sensible people say that's that's nonsense, but They'll still talk about a militant atheist, and they'll call you and me militant atheists. And you know, as I say, I don't know what 
a militant atheist, someone who throws pamphlets at people or something. But but you're called militant just for asking the question, is not is this sensible? Well, look, there are a couple of things to, to say about this. I mean, we, we agree, okay? Yeah. If, if it weren't for young kids being indoctrinated, then mm. very unlikely indeed that religions would survive. Mm-hmm. But it's also the case that um, the, the people need... We have a, a, a psychological need yeah. for explanations which are cast in the form of stories, of narratives. Sure, sure. And um, it's not just that people don't think, it's that in a way they they can't think, because it's a really hard thing to think about. The origin of the universe, the nature of the universe, the meaning of what happens mm. in the universe, where we're all going to go when we die, you know, all mm. those are really, really big questions. So to, to um, deal with the apparent impossibility of getting any answers off your own bat anyway, you're going to turn to something. Now, any religion, any religion can Mm. be explained. Its doctrines, its tenets, its promises, the story about the universe, its origins, Mm. and so on. Any religion can be explained in less than half an hour. Uh It takes a bit longer to learn physics, okay? So (laughs) so you you can see why that narrative, that encapsulation of of a thing which has explanation and meaning all packaged into it is is very attractive to people. And they they don't hang on to it for intellectual reasons. They hang on to it for profound emotional reasons. And that leads me on on, on to my second point, which is this. A couple of years before that Challenger Things book, I, I wrote a book called The God Argument. Yeah. Now, this was a kind of follow-up to stuff that our, all our friends in mm. the movement you mm-hmm. know, have, have written about. So uh, the late demented Christopher Hitchens mm-hmm. and, and Richard Dawkins yeah. himself and um, Dan Dennett mm-hmm. and Steve Pinker and others, mm-hmm. all, all, all our, our mates have written yeah. about these things. I wanted to, to agree with them mm-hmm. on, on you know, everything central to what they said, but I wanted to add something, which is this. A lot of people uh, will say to you, well, if you take religion away, then what are people are left with? What do they believe in? What gives them their morality and their their sense of meaning in life? And I say to them, look, there is a fantastic, a much better alternative. And this is humanism. Yeah. Uh, Humanism has its roots in the the, uh, philosophical thinking of Socrates, Aristotle, and others in the classical tradition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't predicate the existence of a god. uh, Our morality is not something dictated from outside human experience. Instead, humanism says this, let's think for ourselves. Let's take responsibility for thinking for ourselves about how we are going to treat other people Uh, How are we going to relate to them? How are we going to live together in communities? How are we going to do the things that we know? I mean, because we know that the vast majority of people don't like to be cold and lonely and hungry and in pain and and deprived of possibilities and so on. We we know we, we've got we we just have this uh, um, you know basis of knowledge about what conduces to human flourishing. Let's work for that. Let's work for that together. You know, it's not about brownie points getting into heaven or something. It's because we're human beings and we have sympathies. Mm. That is the, the the basis of humanism. And when you when you start to, to think about the sorts of things that people have said when you read, I don't know, again, Aristotle mm-hmm. or Seneca yeah. or, yeah. you know, or a- anybody in, in the great tradition of thought over the last couple of thousand years who've addressed this question of how we can make lives meaningful and significant, how we can uh, foster relationships, how things like our intimacies, our love, our family lives, our community engagements and so on can, can really make life feel good and rich for us. When we when we understand how art, music, learning, uh, endeavor mm-hmm. are, 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 are meaningful, then we can understand that it's all here in life, between the cradle and the grave. You yeah. don't have to reach outside it for something that's going to give you meaning, because you can create meaning if you will do it, if you will take that effort. I mean, one, one good example of this is the so-called existentialist tradition. Sure. You know, people like to wave their arms and say, Jean-Paul Sartre and yeah. Albert Camus and so yeah. on. But you know, they had a couple of good points to make. Oh, I, I'm a big fan. Yeah, <laughs> Camus wouldn't describe himself as an existentialist because he fell out with Sartre. He would yeah. say he was, a, he was a, an absurdist. Yeah. What they both agree on is this. You know, we don't get born for a reason. There's yeah. no purpose here. We're not sent into the world yeah. by some great headmaster in the mm-hmm. sky yeah. who's given us a job to do or anything. Mm-hmm. We just find ourselves in the world mm-hmm. and, and in a, a set of historical and social conditions. And it's up to us to accept the fact that we have to make certain kinds of choices for ourselves and that m- meaning is possible for us if we create it. Yeah. 
Camus has this marvellous essay, I'm sure most of the uh, people listening to this mm. know it, uh, an essay called The Myth of Sisyphus, uh -huh. where he, just, he says, okay, so think about that myth, that Greek myth about Sisyphus who has to roll the boulder up yeah. a hill and he's never going to get to the top and this is going to go on for eternity. Can his existence be meaningful to him? Mm. And he gives the answer, yes. Yes, absolutely. Now that is powerful. That's, that's pretty damn it deep was, when it, you think it, about it. It, it yeah. totally affected me. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, I ended, a lot, ended one of my books with referring back to that in my book yeah. about Adam because as a young person, that, the realization that you can make the meaning in your own world, in a world that's absurd in, in a general sense, is profoundly important, I think. Sure. Well, that's it. That's that resource. So, so humanism, which is about, you know, our, our relationships, but also about our individual responsibilities um, to respect the meanings that other people are creating in their lives. Obviously, you know, that the, the, there is a, a question of where we draw our lines. You know, they say an open mind is a great thing. Well, not so open that your brains yeah, fall out. Okay, yeah. so, all right. Yeah. That, that in, in the case of, of our ethical lives, mm -hmm. we've got to think about the sorts of lines that uh, we, we don't regard as being crossable. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are cruel, who are harmful, who are greedy, who yeah. are selfish, who do bad things to other people, we're not going to accept that. But what we are going to accept is that there are as many ways that lives can be good or meaningful to people as there are people to live them. And none of us has a right to say to anybody else, no, you're not allowed to do that or see that or think that or feel that or act that way. That's, that's their business if they don't cross that line. But we can be guided. I think that's the point of much of what you, you do. We can be guided in our own personal search. You actually put this to work, and in, 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 you put your pen where your mouth is, and and uh, wrote a book, a version. Uh, you know, many people think of the Bible as the guide for for life, which and the Bible is an awful. And no one would ever want to guide their lives by the Bible, not literally, um, because of the of the violence and misogyny and everything else that's in the Bible. But you wrote a book, I think it was called the Good Book or something, which was a humanist version of the Bible. It was basically stealing from the ideas and traditions and beautiful poetry and thought uh, 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 throughout the world written in, a, in, in verse as the Bible as a potential guide that people could use to think about how to live their lives. So, oh, Yeah. Well, you know, th this is a long time ago, more than 35 years ago now. Uh, in fact, when I was a graduate at, uh, at Oxford and I was thinking to myself, uh, ethical systems fall into two broad categories. On the one hand, there are the divine command mm -hmm. types of moralities where some deity says, this is how you've got to live, otherwise you're going to fry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other are fundamentally humanist uh, um, moralities, yeah. which start from the uh, question of, of our human nature and experience. And I thought to myself, you know, if only people had gone to that second resource to the historians and the poets and the philosophers and the letter writers and so on, no mention of gods or religion or afterlife or anything else, and just noticed that in that resource there is an enormous amount of insight, consolation, sure. inspiration. And if they put together uh, you know, texts from, from that into a, a biblos, a, a yeah. book, yeah. that could have been a resource for, yeah. for people to give them guidance and insight and so on, instead of the Bible with all this stuff about God and hell and, yeah. and, and heaven what a different world it would be. And I thought to myself, do you know, somebody ought to do it. And then I thought, oh, damn. <laughs> because, you know, when you, when you think that, you realize it has to be you. So anyway, it took a long, long, long time to do it because I plundered all the literatures of the world to, to cull these texts and to do to them exactly what had been done to the Bible because we know from scholarship how the Bible was made. Yeah. It was made out of, you know, abstracting texts sure. and paraphrasing them and joining them together and editing them and so on. So I did the same with all these to put together this this book, the the good book, yeah. and um, and I, I I don't know, you know, people might think it was a, an act of temerity or of madness or something, but uh, I can imagine that in a couple hundred years' time, maybe, maybe I'll be maybe, a god. Yeah, you never yeah. know. <laughs> exactly. That's such great. That was, but I better register yeah, right yeah, now. I'll yeah, be a really yeah. bad one. Okay? <laughs> even though the bar hasn't been set very high in history, you know, I'll be even worse than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. That yeah. book that designed itself to not have not have any divine uh, be, will become in the long run. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem of history, I suppose. But um, in talking about the, the uh, look, certainly humanism and, and what, what, what philosophers and poets and have written about are the same things that have inspired many, much of many religious writing. And, and I think you're, you're right. Well, I, it's not profound to say you're right in the sense that there's no doubt that religion as it's carried out fulfills a need for many people. There's an innate, as you say, there's an innate need to, 
find purpose in things, even when there isn't purpose, mm-hmm. first of all. That's not, maybe not such a productive thing. But there's an innate need for community and, and many, many things that religious uh, experiences provide. Um, and so I think when we talk about moving past religion, we, it is absolutely true that we need to be able to meet those human needs in a way that's maybe more productive, less divisive, and more true to the real world. Uh, you know, I can tell you a, a, an interesting little anecdote about this. So some some years uh, before I did the good book, uh, mm. the person who was then the Archbishop of Can- Canterbury, a very nice guy called Rowan Williams, yes. um, he'd written a book about Dostoevsky's mm. ethics, and he invited me to come and do a kind of doubleheader with him, discussion mm. about Dostoevsky and, and mm. ethics and stuff, which we did at the Pushkin Institute. Uh, it was really great fun. So w- w- when the um, good book was uh, being published, I got in touch with him. I said, look, you owe me. You've got to come and do it. <laughs> Doubleheader with me about this. Yeah. So we did this doubleheader at the uh, uh, Royal Festival Hall here in London, mm-hmm. in front of a big audience. We had an hour's discussion between the two of us, and we talked for fifty-five minutes without any reference whatever to God right. or religion, because yeah, yeah. we agreed about so much. Absolutely. And there, there was so much of the stuff that was in the, the good book, which is common to anybody who is sincere about the idea of trying to think, how, how, could, how can one live productively, meaningfully? How can one create good relationships in, in the world? How can we try and make the world a better place? There's so much agreement there. And it was only in the last five minutes that he kind of remembered, you know, yeah, he's yeah, a, yeah. officially, yeah. he's yeah. made yeah. Yeah. Got to say something about God, well, so, which he did. But that was right at the very end. Now, mm. that illustrates the fact that you don't need all the God stuff. Somehow or other, the connection between good lives mm-hmm. and uh, and godly lives has become inextricable in many yeah. people's minds. And it's also the case that uh, we've we've lost the sense that what we think of as uh, the, you know spiritual replenishment mm. now. Whenever people use the word spiritual, they mean something to do with transcendence mm-hmm. and deity. And yeah. I, I say. If I could use the word in an entirely secular sense, just to mean yeah. the complex of my emotions and my sure. intellectual attitudes and so on, then I think the spiritual side of our lives is the most important yeah. fact about us. Well, Enjoying things like beauty and uh, love and music. Yeah I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think so. Although it's semantics, this word spiritual just resonates with me personally the wrong way. But, yeah, it does with but, me too. Yeah, but, yeah, sure. But, you know, and I often think, well, there, people go to church every Sunday, and and or what, or synagogue, or whatever they do, uh, and uh, and we could replace that with something else. Would be a sense of community, rock concerts, or or poetry readings, or whatever you want. But you know, it was actually um, an interesting, uh, a very intelligent man who was actually a TV host in, in in the United States, and I never realized how intelligent he was until I met him. A guy named Hugh Downs, who who. Uh, was a, a news uh, correspondent, but also a, um, a game show host. And but he he was in his eighties, and he said to me something I never thought of before. He said, "You know why people have to go to church every Sunday?" He says, "The stories are so silly that you need to go be reinforced every week." You know, and I thought about it. we don't we don't have quantum mechanics classes every every Sunday to reinforce <laughs> even as crazy as we you learn it once you don't need to be reminded of it every Sunday with a bunch of other people going oh yes that's right and he he argued that that was a way of sort of communal, I guess you would talk about communal uh, uh, brainwashing in the sense that you, you feel this community and it just doesn't seem so silly when you see all these other people being involved. Right, reinforcement. Yeah, yeah reinforcement. I'd, never, I'd never thought of it. Well, you know, that there was a guy back in the 19th century, a man called Auguste Comte, yeah, who course. was responsible for his, for his version of positivism, yeah. Yeah. who set up a whole atheist church uh-huh. you know, with, with, with uh, um, services and people yeah, get yeah. together on Sunday to be yeah. atheists yeah. together and so on. And that is so misconceived <laughs> because, you know, the, the kind of lives that, that we want to live, uh, going for a walk, having dinner with yeah. friends, uh, reading a good yeah. book, um, doing an experiment, you know, yeah. uh, uh, thinking about something. Those are the things that reinforce for us the yes. value of our existence. Yeah. And we don't have to get together with a bunch of other people and say, we don't believe in God. Yeah, yeah. You know? not believing is not a belief system. <laughs> yeah. And, that's a, and exactly. that actually, there was re- the, the Templeton Foundation, which we both agree is kind of nonsensical, or at least I actually think it's in, insidious and a little bit evil myself. But, but, uh, they give these these prizes basically to any scientist who says good things about God will eventually win it, and uh, and and it was someone this year who who said something that I, I just found unbelievably facile, which was that atheism was unscientific, and 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 in fact, as you point out, that it's not a belief system; it's a choose not to believe. So, in fact, he he was arguing in favor of agnosticism, but agnosticism is a form of atheism. Is just simply saying 
the evidence isn't sufficient for me to believe is what a you know as what a, many people who would say they're agnostic would would say but that is a for, not believing is a is just a form of atheism so it's just well look this this takes us back to the point uh, we made much earlier about rationality mm-hmm. um you know, if I, sometimes people say, will you come on a radio program and discuss uh, religion? And I say, no, I'm fed up with discussing that. But what I will discuss <laughs> is whether or not there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. And they say, oh, you're being trivial. I say, no, I'm not, because the arguments against there being fairies are just the same as the arguments against there being gods and goddesses. And, and, and I want to dramatize the point that this is about rational belief. Yes. This is about having, you know, the kind of evidence to which you proportion your uh, thoughts about what the world is like and, and how you act. So I, I, I make the point uh, to people, I say, look, um, you know about induction, right? You know that, that no inductive inference is ever guaranteed. So look, you've been wet every time you've been in the rain without an umbrella in the past, but maybe the next time you won't get wet. So would yeah. it be rational to take, not take an umbrella the next time it rains? The answer is no. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's, that, it's that degree of strength. It's that, it's that um, what, what, what's the expression of, of uh, uh, approaching zero, you know? Asymptotic. The, uh, asymptotic approach to zero, yeah, of probability yeah. that there are fairies at the bottom of the garden or gods yeah, yeah, in yeah. the sky. Yeah. That, that's the kind of Yeah, thing. and in fact, in science, we uh, that's the point is, we never, and in fact, I never used, I try not to use the word believe because that's not a good word. So things are likely or unlikely, very likely or very unlikely. And sure. when they reach a certain level of being very unlikely, we just, you know, they're, they're not the case. And, uh, well, and it becomes literally irrational yeah. to, to believe them or, or to act yeah, upon them. Yeah, exactly. It becomes yeah. literally irrational to, be, to, to act upon something that's so extremely unlikely as yeah. to, yeah. Okay, we agree. Well, I was very pleased that you trashed someone who I like to trash because, you know, everyone talks about the kindler, gentler religion when, and they refer to Buddhism and they love this guy, the Dalai Lama, who I find uh, also, um, n- well, by comparison, of course, he he he. He seems many things he says seem seem reasonable, and and um, and he you make great fun in, in in one of your book about his statement about many faiths one truth. I love I, I think I wrote it down here because I just love you said various religions are mutually exclusive, mutually blaspheming, mutually hostile, bitterly and deeply divisive, and thus a rash of open sores in the flesh of humanity. <laughs> and 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 so maybe we could just trash the Dalai Lama together for a little bit and just make sure we've covered all our bases. Well, I think what the Dalai Lama illustrates is that uh, if you get people who are, you talked about, people who are charismatic yeah. earlier and who become yeah. great celebrities because yeah. they have charm and, yeah. they're, and they're, they're obviously very nice and they're very careful about yeah. how they put their point. Yeah. Um, uh, and they... they provide a kind of mask for a whole range of things behind them, which get more and more and more absurd, and in some cases more and more and more dangerous, as we can see in the effects that they have, distorting lives, you know, being against women, being against control of fertility, Mm. even indeed uh, prompting people to commit mass murder. So, you know, you you have the reasonable and the nice people, and and then they, they, they make... Uh, um, make it more difficult in a way to say, actually, the things that even these very, very nice people believe are connected with things that that uh, it's it just brings a lot of bad stuff in, into play. And, and so that, I think, is the difficulty with them. Now, I, I take the view that you should be respectful and, and kind to, to every human individual, yes. no matter what their beliefs and so on, so yeah. long as they're not doing harmful things. Yeah, yeah. But not... Um, you should not be respectful and polite about beliefs that you yeah. think are wrong or dangerous. Yeah, it's the people you can respect, but the beliefs you don't have any yeah, need to sure. respect. So I have, uh, I have uh, you know, plenty of time for the Dalai Lama as a person. Yeah, he sure. seems to be a perfectly nice sure. chap and so on. But, but on the other hand, uh, you know, he's, he's the front man for um, a belief system and an organization which really doesn't, doesn't stack up when, when you start looking at what they <laughs> well, say. Well, his what they position do. is due to something that's openly ludicrous, yeah. re- reincarnation, which is this, not as much nonsense as anything else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And but you know, and and actually, I've been amused because I, at some point he said, "Look, if the tenets of science uh, disagree with Buddhism, well, of course we'll dispense with them." And I feel like saying, "Okay, resign." With them meaning science, or no, them no, meaning no, Buddhism? No, Buddhism. He just says, uh, you know, because he he likes to make uh, uh, common ground with science, and I admire that, of course. But he literally, literally says, if there ever happens that a result of science disagrees with one of the tenets of Buddhism, as uh, we discussed it, then we, of course we will dispense with that. And I can't help but think that that okay. Well, then the whole point of being Dalai Lama, you should just just go, be, you know, go, become a philosopher and and do something useful. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I want to I want to 
round up here with with coming back to science and the humanities actually a little bit. Um, you wrote about, uh, an essay about basically saying science isn't the end. There's a there's somehow this notion that science is the enemy of humanities, which has also been a reoccurring that that, that or is concerned to both of us. And I know Steve Pinker's written a lot about it as well. But that that um, that somehow science takes away the meaning of life. And maybe I, I would I wanted to chat with you a little bit about that, and, and then return ultimately to democracy at the end and in, in the context of science. So right. So. Well, let's put this into a context, an historical context that a lot of people will will uh, relate to. So the Enlightenment. Um, in in the, the, the 17th, 18th century, there were people who said, let's apply uh, standards of scientific rationality to a much wider range of subjects. Let's, let's do history on scientific principles. Let's think about society and political organization on scientific principles. Let's try and understand human nature in that way. And so th th this was trying to, to think in an, an orderly and disciplined sure. way about things. And it had tremendous consequences. I mean, you think of the outcome of the Enlightenment in the great changes politically and, and uh, socially that followed it. The advent, for example, of democracy and of human rights and civil liberties and uh, the much wider spread of education and the refutation of the claims of absolute monarchy and of, and of religion. So these were good things. And there were, of course, people much later, people like Horkheimer and Adorno and others in the Frankfurt School who said, ah, the Enlightenment was to blame for Nazism and Stalinism because it privileged kind of organized bureaucracy and bureaucracy goes rotten after a time, mm -hmm. blah, blah. They're wrong about that. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's a different story. <laughs> but the people who objected to Enlightenment uh, rationality mm -hmm. were, were um, the Romantics who said, mm -hmm. If you have reason dominating life, then it desiccates life. It, yeah. it just it takes all the color and all the magic and music out mm. of it. And we think, we romantics, we think that it should all be about well, how we feel and it should be about our connection with the soil or the land or the people or the folk or the this, that, and the other. Yeah. Now, I like to point out that we would not for one minute like to dispense with the poetry and the music of romanticism, mm. but we could certainly do without the politics and sociology <laughs> and anthropology of romanticism, because mm. that's where nationalism and Nazism mm. and racism and all that stuff come from. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about, you know, our adherence to the land or to mm. the blood or mm. to our ancestors mm. or, you know, the race or something, you know, all, all that is pernicious and we've seen the effect of that. So the anti-rationalist uh, reaction to the Enlightenment produced all these evils which really, you know, uh, um, caused so many deaths. And think of the first, especially the Second World War. Um, and it, it illustrates, gives you this marvellous historical illustration of how if you are just irrationally anti-rational uh, and you get to privilege all sorts of other things that dominate the way you act and think about the world, you're going to get into trouble. Because the rationalism of the Enlightenment itself never, ever claimed that reason should operate at the expense of emotion yes. or at the expense of those things in life that give it its sense of value and, and sentiment. In fact, it's so interesting to notice that in the Enlightenment itself, the idea of sentiment, the idea of the importance of, of romance in life, the idea that our emotions are important motivators for our choices in life. David Hume, one of the great figures in Reason the Enlightenment. Reason is a slave of yeah, passion. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the, the, in, in other words, the result was that um, the, the Enlightenment drive to think more rationally, uh -huh. not at the expense of our emotions, but just more rationally, was read by those who were frightened of what reason might expose about the inadequacies of absolute monarchy and religious yeah. tyranny, you know, to, to do this black and white thing, oh, all, all reason is bad. But now you see this encapsulated in something which, again, actually I saw, that it was in talking about the Templeton Prize recently, but but this term, which is invented, which as far as I can see is meaningless, but scientism, that somehow, that that's a, that, that where scientists are accused of scientism, which is somehow demeans the humanities and also demeans any, any, anything but science at all, uh, uh, that scientific reasoning is, is, uh, is everything. And, uh, and it, it invents a, a straw man that as far as I can tell, not only doesn't exist, but in fact, there's not there's nothing wrong with at some point saying that if you call science what I think you and I would call science, which is really a, a like philosophy, rational thought, reason applied to experience, reanalysis, 
it's some that that is the basis of of of, of, of much writing and poetry and 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 music and 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 art. It's it, there's nothing. There's no. There's no. That separation is artificial. Well, I agree. Well, you know, the the, the great problem with people who um, talk about scientism is that they want to reserve something, some part of the explanation for what they do or think in the shadows, yeah. in mystery, in obfuscation, in, yeah. in, in something which is inarticulable. This is why when you discuss with uh, um, people who have a, a deep commitment to a religion, that if you push them and push them and push them, eventually you get to the position where they say, look, God is infinite, we're finite, so it's ineffable, we can't explain or understand it, and so on. And then that explain and then anything follows from that. You know, it's it's that it's that recourse to something that can't be explained. Yeah. And saying that it explains something. You know, you and yeah. I might say, if it can't be explained, then it can't be explained. So that's yeah. the motivation for trying to explain, explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas they say, the fact that it can't be explained is an explanation by itself. And, that's and, no good. and it's also is an incredibly, uh, it involves a cred- credible hubris, hubris because y- y- how do you know it can't be explained until you try and explain it? That's yeah. what always bothers me. We'll never understand love. We'll never understand this. We'll never understand. Well, that implies you know enough to know that we'll never understand it. It really yeah. kind of amazes me because, and, and. Defeatist and, as well. Yeah, and they say that, high, you know, scientists are are arrogant and not humble, but it seems to be much less humble to say we know that we can never know. It, and uh, and it's, a, it's, it's unfortunately created an artificial uh, antagonism that I see too often rightly in the humanities for, for arguing that science is encroaching on in different domains, and it's not, as you say, it's not that at all. But it's an interesting, it's it's a debate that's happening. That that well, look, it's certainly true that there are people. Look, Wittgenstein, for example, uh, in both his early and his late philosophy, was quite quite um, keen, really, to to stop certain areas of thought mm-hmm. from being explained by psychology or sociology or something. Yeah. Religion, you know, he yeah. he wanted, he didn't really talk very much about it, but he certainly wanted to protect it from the debunking encroachments of any kind of empirical inquiry. Are there psychological reasons why people uh, cleave to religious beliefs? Answer, yes. But then people who have religious <laughs> beliefs don't want that to be uh, <laughs> yeah. how you go. So, you know, th- 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 that's part of the motivation that people have for saying that they want to uh, to try somehow to put a cap on on what science can uh, claim to be able to do or to explain, but I think that that intellectual honesty. So we go back mm. to the whole business about the, the the kind of intellectual honesty and integrity that we need to apply. Says that, that nothing should be immune to to question from any exactly. Direction. And you know, and I'm I'm not only guilty of that, but proudly guilty of that. As I mean, part of what I've done in the last few of my books and, and is, is say, look, there are questions that science, that you say quant- science is supposed to address, like, why is there something rather than nothing? Or, or why are we here? And my point is that we've learned a lot and science has informed that discussion tremendously, like it or not. We've ch- actually changed what it means to say, why is there something rather than nothing? And people do object that, that how dare science address this question that it can never possibly address. And you're absolutely right. Anytime you say that questioning is 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 wrong of any sort by anyone uh then 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 that's problematic and that that I, that allows us to return to where we began actually uh, uh you wrote an essay about science and democracy and and uh, and you have argued uh, as i've often was sympathetic to the notion that that science may not it may not be causal but it's, it's very difficult to imagine democracy without science or science without democracy in the sense that science ultimately leads you to say Everything is subject to question. And that, of course, is difficult in a, situ- a system that isn't democratic. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's part of the foundations of a, of a democratic uh, order. Mm-hmm. And, and remember, a democracy is not just about periodic elections. Sure. It's about a situation where people can discuss, debate, ask mm-hmm. questions, challenge, mm-hmm. put forward ideas, have them shot yeah. down and stuff. You know, I, I remember some years ago being invited by the UN Development Agency to go to Bhutan, which had just uh, reconstituted itself as a democracy. It was really mm. interesting. The, the the former king had decided that he had enough had enough of being a tyrant, <laughs> so he he said, uh, "Right, we're going to have a democracy," and he imposed democracy on his people <laughs> against the will of the people. Actually, they <laughs> yeah. didn't want it but anyway. Yeah, they had it. So there was this conference there, and it was absolutely delightful because it's a delightful country, and the people are great. And there's a little government that had eight ministers and the prime minister. 
minister. <laughs> and uh, so we're discussing the idea of what a democratic order is like. Mm-hmm. And uh, this m- very minor contribution that I made to the discussion was to say, look, uh, the sound of democracy is is noise, is noisy, because mm-hmm. there's discussion and debate and disagreement and so on. The sound of tyranny is silence. Oh. That's because nobody gets a chance yes, to, to put, put a point yeah. of view or to ask a question or to disagree. So it's only in the noisy uh, you know, bits of the world where when people can ask and investigate, where they can do stuff, to fi- find out how things work, that you get the possibility of, of any kind of discovery. It might, might be historical discovery or psychological or scientific discovery in general. So there's a very natural connection between uh, allowing people to think and question and explore uh, and uh, a democratic order. In fact, the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries really started after the Reformation, not because Protestants were more interested in science than Catholics. It's not true. Galileo was a Catholic yeah. and he was interested in science. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's not, it wasn't a Protestant-Catholic uh, thing, except in the following sense, that in the Protestant parts of Europe, the religious authorities were not powerful enough to stop people from okay. thinking. Yeah, yeah. And that's what allowed science to start get going. Of course, it started with Kabbalah and Hermeticism yeah, yeah, and astrology yeah, yeah, sure. and so on. But out of all that, the, the fact that people could think and discuss was a, a really powerful impetus for people who were serious-minded and who wanted to do serious science. Yes, yes. And not just Kabbalah, but, I mean, Newton spent most of his time in religious thinking. He, he was did. a part-time physicist or something. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> he did pretty well. But... Um, but the, uh, that when I was reading that, and I was I've been thinking about this lately because you also in that book are sympathetic to something I am too, which is that concerns about freedom of speech in China, for example, which is undoubtedly, as you point out, and I think it's clear, is going to be prote- most likely the dominant economic force in the world in, in, in the latter part of the century. But this is an interesting question because China is working extremely hard to become a scientific leader, at the same time as it has a system. Where where dissent is certainly not uh, easily allowed, and it's a different kind of thing that you know. Russia, this former Soviet Union have used to have well, it had very bad science, uh, uh, but it also had very good scientists. I kind of think that the difference was there in the Soviet Union. Everyone knew the government was lying. It just sort of well, we understood that, but but you know, everyone was skeptical on the side, and they all could talk. And maybe it bred that kind of intercession. Whereas in it used to be, as a physicist, I would get very good students from China. At, at the undergraduate level and beginning graduate level, because they do very well in their exams, the problem became after that, partly which was their training to respect their, their teachers too much, never to want to disagree, which of course is, is an anathema to, mm. to any, any emerging scientist. But nevertheless, China is proceeding by leaps and bounds in science. And so I wanted to ask you about that, that potential tension and where you see it going? Yeah, sure. So this is this is really interesting and needs some sort of digging into. Firstly, uh, I, I spent a bit of time living and teaching in China, actually. Mm. So this I have first-hand experience yeah. of this. Uh, I, I can't disagree with the teacher yeah. <laughs> business, which is, of course, the you know diametric opposite Absolutely. of what, what should be happening. There. Yeah. If you dig a little bit into what's going on, you, you will see that there is a, a particular application of a general truth about mm. any. Uh, sort of tyrannical regime. Tyrannical regimes are much, much more efficient than democratic ones. Sure. Because yeah. they don't waste time and they energy on discussing on stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, they, and they, don't, they don't change policy yeah. every few years because yeah. there's been an election. They just yeah. go for it. Yeah. Okay? So the particular application of this is that they, they will encourage and fund, uh, you know, up to the hilt, uh, scientific research projects which are going to bake bread for them. Uh-huh. So on alternative energy sources and high-speed mm. transport mm. and, you know, all the technologies mm. or space. And and also those areas of science which have very high status. So they, they want to, you know, get the Nobel Prizes and, mm. and publish more than anybody yeah. else and, and, you know, make the discoveries in those areas of science which happen to be at the moment, the ones that, that are really hot. Yeah, okay. okay. So, the, so there are two areas of science there, the ones that, that are going to be uh, technologically and economically very productive and mm-hmm. the ones that are going to be, be very high status. Mm-hmm. How much completely open blue sky scientific research and thinking there is in China, I wonder. 
the, 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 um, the, the situation in the Soviet Union is actually a you know kind of 1950s black yeah, and white yeah, version yeah, of yeah, what's happening yeah, now in, yeah. in China, which is that you, you had all the spurious stuff about how you can you know, increase production yeah, and so yeah, on, yeah. a million fold yeah, yeah. in impossible ways. But you also had a huge amount of time, energy, effort, and, and resource going into building uh, um, nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so it, that that's kind of tells you how in a regime like that, like the Stalinist or Soviet regime or like the Chinese regime, they're going to direct what happens in science for a very particular strategic reasons. It's mm -hmm. not like science in the US or, or in Europe. Well, but I'll tell you, and maybe this is a cause for hope, is that I see I see changes in 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 scientists and students from China. I see them uh, I, in my own field, which is after all a very uh, abstract and esoteric field, but also high status in the sense of particle physics and fundamental science. Uh, I'm beginning to, I see changes taking place in a, 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 a culture of questioning, a culture, the, the same, and you can't help it because they're interacting with with scientists from from around the rest of the world. And the scientific culture is, as far as I can see in, in my own field is, is, is growing in, in China. And maybe whether that will have an impact in, politically, I, I don't know. But. Well, you know, back, back in the 17th, 18th centuries, when people published stuff of a, political, of a politically inflammatory nature, uh -huh. um, e even though the authorities did from time to time crack down, they sometimes didn't bother because not very many people could read. Yeah. So, you know, the situation in, in China would be that if somebody is working in a very esoteric region of astrophysics <laughs> or something, they're not going to be too bothered about it because the great majority of the population are not really going to cotton okay. on oh, to any interesting. implications interesting. <laughs> that, that it might have. So, so, you know, it's kind of protected in that way. It's like the fact that when I, I first walked into uh, the, uh, the the Second Language Institute in, in Beijing mm -hmm. back in 1982, mm -hmm. and there on the shelf was uh, John Stuart Mill on Liberty and Tom Paine, mm -hmm. Rights of Man. Mm -hmm. I thought, blimey, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. these should be very incendiary mm -hmm. texts yeah. uh, in the Chinese context. And then I then I clocked it. Nobody could read English, so it didn't matter <laughs> that they were there. You know? <laughs> okay. So it's a bit like that. You, you can think that there has to be some agenda yeah. uh, but behind why um, China would be putting tremendous resources into developing uh, in, in areas of science as they are, because they are yeah. becoming an incredibly big player. Uh -huh. You know, they, they are now more advanced than a lot of other people in, in a number of areas, including renewable energy, for oh, example. Sure. Spending a tremendous yeah. amount. This much is because more. they need to be. Yeah, sure. And well, the interesting question will be to what extent the rise of scientific enlightenment can, had a, if you look at the European example, was tied to the to the to the creation of democracy. Now, yeah. you you put your finger on it, okay? Because the whole point about the Enlightenment is that that people firstly had access to some of the results of what was mm -hmm. going on in the sciences, and then thought that they would apply it more generally. And in doing so, began to ask some extremely hard questions about the prevailing system. Is that going to be possible in China? I hope it is, because if it is, it will be transformative. Well, and I hope it is not just in China but in England and the United Kingdom and the United States. And let's hope, therefore, go back to where we began, that the, that the importance of, of informed questions, which is really at the heart of philosophy, it, that we can celebrate it and we can hope it will have a, a positive impact. And, and thank you for having a positive impact on my day by spending time talking to me. Thanks yeah, a lot. It's great to talk to you, Lawrence. Great. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, and Rob Zepps. Directed and edited by Gus and Luke Holwerda. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.